So welcome everybody to the Productivity Engineering uh, Silicon Valley Meetup. My name is Mike McGar and this is Sangeeta. Um, Sangeeta and I have been uh, running this meetup for, I think, I don't know, some variation of this meetup for a year and a half. Um, and so I'm gonna kick it off. So we'll start off with, uh, I'm gonna give you an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna kick us off by talking about the history of this meetup a little bit, because I wanna give some context for those who have been to a previous incarnation of the meetup and where we're going. Uh, and then uh, Sangeeta is gonna share this, uh, our ideas on productivity engineering. I'm gonna talk a little bit about productivity engineering at Netflix. And then um, we're lucky enough to have Pan here from Strava, who's gonna also talk about productivity engineering at Strava. And so we'll hopefully get through this quickly, but um, effectively. So productivity engineering Silicon Valley reboot. What does that mean? So early last year, Sangeet and I, who uh, we both work at Netflix, I manage the Netflix developer productivity team. Sangeet manages the Edge developer experience team. Both of our teams do very similar things, and we got to talking about kind of the parallels between our teams, the challenges we have, um, the work that we do, and some of the innovative solutions we've come up with. And we have began looking around the industry um, for at conferences and meetups and, and trying to see who else is talking about some similar things. And I think we were a little um, surprised to see there wasn't as much conversation as we would have liked around some of the, the challenges we have. And so it got us thinking, well, maybe, you know, there's something that we need to start. We build a community around some of this work. And we didn't, so we started thinking about what we do um, with a community and we, we decided uh, starting a meetup would be the next best thing. And we started the developer experience Silicon Valley meetup. And this was probably last year. And things went well. We had a great lineup of speakers. We would do, do we're doing a talk every other month with two speakers. We had um, we talks from LinkedIn. We had talks from PayPal, Coursera, and of course Netflix. And uh, you know we we had great attendance. Um, we even had we recorded all the, the videos. Like I did, uh, just talked about recording and got you. Everyone gave me gave me consent. Uh, so. We were doing pretty well, and, and I think we were excited about the meetup and the progress we'd made. By the way, if you're interested, you can see all the previous talks on YouTube. They're still posted. Uh, but something was missing. And so as Singin and I started exploring this, we realized we had certain challenges as organizers of the meetup, trying to figure out what fit into our meetup and what didn't. So when we talked to people about what they want to talk about, we, we said, well, you know, developer experience is the focus, but what does that really mean? And, and, you know, it's kind of not like testing, but not really like testing and kind of like DevOps. And so we had trouble really self-selecting or selecting what would be a great candidate for the meetup. And we realized that was a problem um, that we needed to address. And so we decided to, rather than continue to have meetups, we took a break from the meetup a little and um, really started thinking about what we were focusing on, what the what problem had originally drawn us to start a meetup. And we still had some questions. So we, we, if we look at our meetups, like Sangeeta's, Sangeeta's team is um, the developer experience team. So what does developer experience mean? What, what about developer productivity? That's my team name. So what do we mean by developer productivity? What about non-developers? So we have, I, I know, know that some people, maybe some people in this room have given me a hard time about uh, the fact that I use developer in, in my team name. Um, what about all the non-developers that work at companies? And what not this just DevOps or isn't this just Agile? So these were questions we, we challenged ourselves with um, around productivity engineering. And um, as we continued to, to talk to uh, not only our peers at Netflix, but also peers in the industry um, at other companies, um, we realized we, um, we, we took our time really coming to this conclusion. We really took our time. And for those of you who have attended, I think the last incarnation of this meetup, it's been a while. But we think it was worth it. Um, we posted a blog post uh, on Medium. I don't know how many how many people here have taken a minute to read this. Okay. If you haven't, I'll send make sure to, to send out the link. Uh, so this was uh, this blog post, and, and Sagita will spend some time talking about the ideas, but we feel like this. Um, writing this, putting this together, and doing some doing some research helped us understand what we we're really talking about. And as we went through this, we realized we, we want really weren't really focused on developer experience, but really this idea of productivity engineering at uh, or, at organizations. 
And as a result of changing or focusing on productivity engineering, we really decided we needed to rebrand the meetup. And so that's why we're here talking about uh, at the productivity engineering Silicon Valley meetup and not developer experience. So that, for those of you who've been to the meetup before, I wanted to give some context about kind of where we've been and, uh, and, and how we got here. But you still might be asking yourself, what is productivity engineering? So I'll let Sangeeta take over for a little bit. Mike, so how many of you here are um, Netflix subscribers? Oh, it's good, many of you. Okay, imagine um, yourself on a weeknight. You had a long day at work, went home, had dinner, um, you know, and decided it's time to wind down. You turn on the TV and you turn on Netflix. And you want to watch. I don't know, what are people watching these days? Stranger Things. There you go, Stranger Things. Um, and, wah, wah, wah. so <laughs> this really happened. It doesn't happen often, but it happened. Um, I'm sure Laura knows about it. <laughs> this was about a couple months ago. And what had happened was an engineer made a change. They thought it was simple, it, it was, you know, someone asked them to do something. It wasn't that hard. They thought it was safe, um, but it wasn't. It ended up black holding a bunch of traffic, and this is what a bunch of our customers saw in um, in a subset of our customers saw. Now, of course, we have all sorts of things like the ability to fail traffic over and all of that, which helps us. But it, this does happen every once in a while. So uh, we did an incident review. Lots of actionable learnings. They're all they've all been implemented by now, and I'm pretty confident that this particular problem isn't going to happen again. Right? So great. Uh, but you know, every once in a while this happens, and most of the time it isn't something that you at home as customers see. Uh, we take care of that behind the scenes, but every once in a while something like this happens. But everything does involve um, someone looking at it, trying to process information, and maybe taking an action. So um, we started thinking about, okay, you know, how can we make this, this better, right? Um, let's take a step back and see how, how we can improve things here. And so we went kind of back to basics, right? So if you think about Netflix, we have, we follow Agile, DevOps, uh, we have a cloud native architecture, we invest in resiliency, fault tolerance, all of that, but we're still, you know, why does it take effort and, and what can we do? So taking a step back, really, what's the goal of the business? We're all working in organizations, working, um, you know, working hard, and really to deliver business value. That's our number one goal. And so practices like Agile, DevOps, uh, talked about this, you know, microservices, serverless, tools, automation, culture, all of these things um, are great. They're, they help us uh, optimize towards getting um, or satisfying our core mission, which is to deliver business value. Now, um, as in physics and in real life, there are also factors that are uh, dragging us down, right, that cause drag. And so these are, take some, some combination of these factors, right? There's complexity. There's complexity in terms of you're, you're always adding new features or uh, you are dealing with in a, a myriad of versions, right? How many Android versions are out there that you're all dealing with? And, you know, used to be you had to worry about, you know, two flavors of mobile devices and uh, a couple browsers uh, or one maybe. And um, now you have to worry about your toaster and your whatever fridge. So, you know, complexity is growing. Scale. Now, scale could be traffic. Uh, scale could be the number of developers. Hopefully, there's a correlation between the two. Um, and availability. And one of the things that as we, we see this, we think about is availability is in, isn't just for companies like Netflix or Facebook or Apple or Google, right? Availability, you know, we've all become kind of like those two-year-olds who need whatever now. And so imagine, you know, Pan, you're going to talk about Strava and you know, 
you know, it's, you know, I take my phone out, I decide to go out for a run or a ride, and, and I want the app working now, right? It's not, it's not cool if it's down for 20 minutes or if it's working. So I think the availability requirements and expectations have, have really gone up. Now, at the same time, um, there's a need to move fast. Right? That you know, speed wins. It doesn't matter what size you are, or whether you're Netflix, you know, Google. You know, you, you want to try to to move fast. So, you know, there's this this tension there, and uh, there are all these uh, requirements that we're trying to fulfill. So, going back to the tools we have today, we follow all these practices. We instill the right culture. We have tools, technology, automation, and you know, a lot of us are doing a pretty good job of it. Uh, we're getting the results we were seeking, but just the, the added cognitive load goes up, right? So these are cycles you're spending worrying about uh, how to scale your software, how to deploy safely, how to move fast. And these are cycles that we'd much rather be spending towards actually making your software better. So, in effect, what we want to do is try to, to streamline this process, right? Try to change the shape of it a little bit. So, you're, you know, you're trying to, as I said earlier, maximize the, the, the energy spent towards solving business value. So, within that framework, then that's really what we think productivity engineering is, right? It's, it's this notion of reducing cognitive load. And we want to spend the bulk of our time and energies towards delivering business value. There's no statement in here about who does it, do you build solutions on your own, do you buy them outside? I think that the whole point here is um, it, somebody is spending the time focused on this, um, and really that's that makes it um, effective, makes the rest of the organization uh, more effective. So we believe that's you know, what it's about. Now, another framework to think about this, and I, was, I sort of alluded to this earlier, is, right? How much, and you know, maybe you're a small company and you're doing some of this already. Maybe you're Netflix and, you know, we have a lot of these things, things already, right? But what's the effort that's going in to achieve the results you want? And imagine if you could get the same results with less effort. So that's what would you do with, with the, the energies that you're saving? So that's really where we think, uh, you know, Mike and my teams, we've spent a lot of our, our energies trying to optimize that. And so within that, we've seen a few patterns, right? These are, um, obviously are influenced a lot um, by what we see here within Netflix, but we have spoken with some folks outside in the community and seen that some of these resonate and what we'd love to uh, do is have a dialogue afterwards with all of you and help you know have you help us define this change it let us know what you think about it so three patterns that we see are um, developer experience platforms and this idea of centralized enablement i'll run through these real quick um, some key themes here and then mike's going to follow up with uh, examples of uh, how we do each of these at netflix so developer experience the core tenet here in my mind is this idea of treating internal tools as products right and that means everything from um, ux or understanding that you're building the right solutions um, your tools should fit into developer workflows the ergonomics is important if it's if someone's got to go out of their way to use something they're not going to use it. it's not going to be effective uh, you know empathy for users uh, you know in my own experience there's a different mindset if you're a server engineer. It's a different mindset if you're, you know, a, a web app developer, a JavaScript engineer. Just what's the, who's your target audience, and tailoring your tools to that. Um, and you know, I like this refined annoyance. It's a term I stole from a podcast I heard um, by I believe um, Jason Yip of ThoughtWorks, and it's this idea of not settling. You know, all of us have been in this scenario where it's 10 clicks to get to this page, or I got to log in there and then I go here and, you know, well, that's the way it is. Or it takes 30 seconds to load a page, well, whatever, I got there and I got my job done. But over time, these things start adding up and you wouldn't go back to uh, Netflix you'd, if it took 
a minute to load every time or, or you know, it's rebuffering. So that's what we should expect and not settle. And I think both if as tools providers and as consumers, um, these are some, some ideas to keep in mind. And really, how quickly can you get um, developers productive? So um, I'll share this, this metric that I found interesting. It's called TTFHW. Anyone want to guess what that is? It's from the API space. Time to first hello world, right? Uh -huh. How quickly can you discover APIs, get your OAuth keys, whatever it is that you need to do? Because it's, you know, want to start using it. So, so those are some ideas there. Um, kind of hand in hand with developer experience or maybe um, a foundation for developer experience is, is, is this idea of platforms. We uh, follow it a lot at Netflix. It, it provides us a lot of value. Um, and some core tenets here are abstraction, right? I don't need to know how service discovery works if my job is to work on recommendations. I don't need to know what version of the compiler I'm using. Or are you upgrading Gradle, whatever it is. Um, extensibility, there is no one size fits all. We know that. And so while we try to target the 80% use case, it's very important to make sure we're not, you know, we're leaving ourselves open to um, extensibilities. And APIs cannot stress that enough. Um, and we have some great examples of, uh, you know, you, of course you build, going back to my previous point, great UX, um, allow users to you know, give them what they need, but you'll never get everybody. So multiple ways to access the underlying functionality um, by using APIs and all that it entails, right? If you, didn't, you manage your versions, backward compatibility and really uh, putting thought into that, I think that's a big part of it. And then the last pattern we see uh, is this notion of centralized enablement. And it could take the form of centralized teams. So here, Mike's team is an example of a centralized team. Uh, Lauren over here is on a centralized team that provides similar functionality for um, for teams to do self-service failure injection testing and things like that, right? Chaos engineering. Um, you know, some organizations have DevOps teams, or it could just be someone on your team who uh, who's whose role is to sort of focus on the So these are some things we, uh, patterns we see. And, um, you know, if you think about it, it's just, just still, still lots of questions here, right? What does productivity engineering mean to, to you all in your organizations? Does it make sense for a small company? Is this only for companies that have over a thousand engineers? I mean, if I'm trying to make sure uh, if it's, you know, well, I want to meet my next milestone and whether I um, do or not you know, is an existential question, right? I should have been investing in this. What role does culture play? And I think a big one is how do you define success? Um, another thing I didn't put in here was a lot of, uh, in my mind, operational um, sort of challenges that how do you get people to start thinking about the operational systems when they're developing, right? Um, the sooner you can do that. So those are awesome questions, lots to answer. We hope you'll help us define that. And I think Mike is now going to talk, give you some more examples of um, some of the concepts that I uh, outlined. Yeah. All right. So, so you did a great job of explaining the core concepts of productivity engineering. Uh, I'm going to try to map this to our experiences at Netflix and and. I'm, we're still exploring this space, and so we're still trying to define what this looks like. And so, like Gita said, please give us feedback and insight and tell us what things resonate and what things seem absolutely foreign or wrong. So going back to this definition that we've come up with of what productivity engineering is, um, I think the key part of this is really that reducing the cognitive load uh, for engineers or for pe employees in your organization. And so, the question that we have to ask is what is what increases cognitive load for engineers at Netflix? So before we get to that point, um, it's important to understand what uh, helps drive decisions for engineers and uh, for teams at Netflix. Uh, Netflix is, so you mentioned this when we talked about DevOps, uh, has a famous high trust culture, right? And so a big reason why I wanted to come to Netflix was because uh, not only the technology and the mission, but also our culture. But what's interesting and why I'm bringing culture up here now is that 
what I was surprised by is how often culture at Netflix ends up being a reason for why we can or cannot implement a technical solution. So to explore like wh what our culture looks like for those who aren't familiar, um, I think it can be easily summed up in three core statements, which is freedom and responsibility, which means we give you know engineers at Netflix a lot of freedom and, and we expect them to also take on a lot of responsibility. Um, also said differently, those with responsibility have the freedom to make a decision. And so that's a good kind of metric I, or, or method I use to understand who, um, who actually has the freedom to make a decision. Teams at Netflix are highly aligned and loosely coupled, which means that we're all driving to the same mission, which is make Netflix the greatest you know, entertainment uh, streaming service possible. But we still have this loose coupling that allows my team to operate in, with some level of autonomy um, and not be coupled and, and, and feel like I have to be work, working in lockstep with every other team at Netflix um, and have some autonomy in the space that I'm, I'm operating in. And then there's also this third concept of context, not control which means that Netflix leadership isn't about giving us um, micromanagement or strict direction, but it's about saying, giving us um, high level guidance and then expecting and trusting that the engineers and, and the individuals at Netflix um, do the right thing. So all of this, this culture creates great opportunities for us and the reason why we have this, but it also creates some challenges. Um, one of the challenges when I mentioned talking about solutions is because of this culture, this high trust culture, we often have to lean on solutions that are more, more about guardrails and less about gates. So if I were to say that we are nervous about engineers pushing to um, a certain region at a certain time of day, a typical answer for an organization might be, let's stop them from doing that and let's, let's put a barrier up for them to do that. Um, Netflix's approach generally because we, we instill so much trust in engineers is we expect that they know what they're doing but at the same time we want to make sure that they have the right information at the right time to make the right decision and so this idea of when we implement solutions inside of tools like uh, Spinnaker for instance which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later um, it tends to bias towards putting up more guardrails and less about stopping people from doing the wrong thing and because we expect that they have the right information at the right time um, because they're closer to that problem. So looking at um, this, uh, the model of how, what we think we see contributing to uh, cognitive load, we have these four things, complexity, at scale, trying to maintain availability and, and velocity. These things are at play and, and, and as you start tweaking one of them um, and you're not, if you're not paying attention, you could cr create an environment that puts significant cognitive load on engineers. So let's walk, let's walk through a couple examples. I'm not gonna talk about every single example we could find at Netflix of where cognitive load is high, but I think I wanna pull out probably about three or four different examples that I think will really help illustrate what we're talking about and, and how culture plays into this. Uh, tool proliferation is one of them. So when I first started um, Netflix, the boot camp for engineers was about, uh, the lab portion was about two hours. And in that two hours, you were creating a project in a Git repo. You were um, creating Jenkins jobs that associated with that. You're creating an application in the t at the time was Asgard and you were uh, deploying this application. It took about two hours to do all that work and it was very manual and it was, it, there was a whole bunch of errors, but, and we had to spend a lot of time on the documentation. A lot of this was because we, we had a whole bunch of tools that weren't necessarily tightly connected or learn how to speak together. Another challenge is, is that we have all these loosely coupled teams that are building all these solutions and they see a problem right then and there. They do the right thing and solve the problem for themselves. They say, hey, I solved this problem. Hey, Lauren, you want to try this? And Lauren says, that's great. Next thing you know, we have this potentially alternative but competing, maybe even better solution out there. And there's maybe three or four of them. You have this concept of tools being proliferated throughout the organization. And because we don't want to constrain, you know, we don't want to sit there and say, no, don't do that. Um, it's really about setting the right context is like, is that the right thing for you to do? But even with that context, we still have this proliferation, this problem of lots of tools out there. For new engineers, it can be daunting to think about which tool to use. We have this other interesting challenge, lifecycle management, which, um, you know, can, what we mean by this, and lifecycle management is vague enough that can mean almost anything you want it to mean. But what I mean in this context is when I create something, what happens to that thing over the life cycle of that, that thing? A great example is these boot camp labs. For the longest time, 
we had nothing that was going on back and cleaning up the bootcamp lab assets. And so people were creating these Git repos and Jenkins jobs and applications and they were just sitting there. Um, that's a small instance of the problem. We, we found an easy way to, to solve that problem. But you can think about how um, we want to solve a different problem, which is I want to make it super easy. Going back to our lab example, I want to make it super easy for somebody to do the creation of their application. I want to get, uh, what's it, TT, what was it? FHW. FHW. I want, to, I want the, the, the smallest TT FHW at Netflix. And so, um, this is a real example, like we, we built generators and applications that will allow me to, with a couple of commands to get an application up and running with Jenkins jobs and Git repo with all the right uh, paved road um, tools in place in you know three minutes. Um, that's great, so that we would reduce the, the, the drag for creating that application. But now we've created a different problem, which is there's a hockey stick of Git repos being created all over the place, right? And they're not being cleaned up. And so how do you manage that cost? It's not maybe hitting you now, but over time it will. So you alluded to this idea of operational experience or this, uh, this the operational cost. So how do we make it easy for an engineer who's wearing a pager for a, um, their application, they get paged in the middle of the night, how do they get the right metrics on their application to know what it's doing? How do they get the right logs? What is that experience like as an operator of your service? And how do you reduce the cognitive load that you, we put on operators for, for services? Just another area where we're really good at making, making it easy to put things out there. We're still trying to make it better for teams to, to operate their services. And I think Sangita's team is doing a great job of, of investing in this practice of operational experience. An area that my team has been working on is this idea of organizational-wide integration. So what I mean by that is um, effectively sharing code. So how many people here have written a library in their organization and shared it with another engineer or team? How many people know how, how many customers of that library there are in their organization? How many can easily manage the APIs that everyone's using and understand who the owners are and be able to refactor on a whim? <laughs> it's hard. It's a really hard problem. So this idea that I can easily share code, I can, I can run a Gradle build, produce a jar, put it in, in our artifact repository, I can start talking to everyone in this room, and it's very easy for everyone to start picking this up and using it. What happens when we, the organization doubles in size or goes up 10 times? and everyone's using that and i need to make a critical api fix or security fix a, a security vulnerability how do i do all of those things how do i know who's using it who's using that line of code if i want to change the line of code who's who am i impacting these are problems that at small scale if, if this is the size of our organization that's a very tenable problem to handle with just like hey everybody I'm, I'm, i need to change the api who's using it great all right cool let's go over here let's let's change it at a large scale, I didn't even know who my customers are. And this is a real problem that happens to engineers at Netflix all the time, which is they don't even know, they think they know, I may have told Sangeeta to use my library, but she's told everyone else in this room, and I don't know who my customers are. These are all, I think, you know, exemplary examples of, of some of the challenges we have, um, I think, that's produced that, that um, increases the cognitive load of engineers um, at Netflix, and likely some of your organizations as well. So how do we make Netflix engineering more productive? So going back to these practices that at, um, that, that Sangeeta uh, laid out, um, we, can, we can kind of start talking about how developer experience platforms and centralized enablement um, are being employed right now to kind of address this high cognitive load, high cognitive load of Netflix. It's really tough to say. So let's talk about developer experience. Um, so this is a picture of Spinnaker. Has anyone seen Spinnaker before? I mean, using Spinnaker right now? No Netflix hands go up. <laughs> so Spinnaker is our um, cloud infrastructure management and delivery uh, platform. It is, our, it is the evolution of, of probably many, many tools, many, many learnings around how we have built and deployed services into the cloud, uh, specifically AWS. Uh, and what we're looking at is the uh, a typical uh, UI for, for looking at your clusters, which various instances you have in the cloud. In this application, each of those green chiclets is one instance in AWS. And so you can see how um, 
So Spinnaker is being used by almost every single application developer at Netflix to deploy to the cloud. Um, why is this, uh, why am I talking about developer experience here? Well, the reason I think Spinnaker is a, a great example for developer experience is uh, highlighting a point that um, Sangeeta made earlier. It's an internal tool, but it's really built like a commercial product. Um, the UI of, of Spinnaker really could stand up, I think, on almost any commercial product um, out there. And it's, it's a very robust tool. The team paid a heavy focus on design and user experience. They put on a lot of effort in understanding the pains of previous solutions. Um, they built on the lessons learned from the team that ran Asgard, which was a previous uh, cloud deployment tool. And then even Sangeeta's team uh, spearheaded a continuous delivery effort to build on top of the lessons learned from Asgard that fed into Spinnaker. So a lot of time spent on how do Netflix engineers really need to deploy and manage their cloud and their cloud services. Um, it focused on not only uh, UI, but also APIs. So this idea that we want to give flexibility to engineering teams to use the APIs just as much as the UIs of Spinnaker. And a lot of teams will actually lean heavily on these APIs to manage their deployments, their, their pipelines and uh, applications. Um, building on another thing that Sangeeta mentioned, which is this idea of extensibility. So uh, Netflix is in AWS, and we have no plans of moving out of AWS. So you could argue that when you're right starting Spinnaker, you could um, you could basically build it to just default to AWS. But the team uh, had enough foresight to just kind of say, well, we'll make it extensible, the idea of a cloud provider built into Spinnaker, which worked out to our benefit when there was a, a fledgling project at Netflix called Titus, which to build an internal cl uh, container cloud at Netflix. This allowed, this extensibility built into Spinnaker allowed the Netflix team, Spinnaker team to add uh, Titus as a container cloud. So now Netflix engineers could choose if their deployment was gonna go to, to Titus or to AWS. And then, I think the last point I want to make here about Spinnaker is this idea of abstraction of the focus niche platforms. And what I mean by that is, oh, I added this. There you go. If we go back to this uh, picture, you're not only looking at Spinnaker and your application, what you're also looking at is, is linking into other systems, other platforms, other tools at Netflix that serve a very niche specific purpose. For instance, you can see right here, I see uh, that there's a link to eat for this particular version of our application, that there's a link to a build. That will lead you to the Jenkins job, which will help gain you get insight into the build aspect of this instance. There are, you can access the um, telemetry platform called Atlas at Netflix from your Spinnaker application. You can figure out the um, uh, how the canaries are doing, which is a whole other system called ACA. You can tap into Lauren's team's, Lauren, we're just gonna pick on you all day. Uh, Lauren's team, he works on the chaos engineering team. Um, they have a tool called CHAP. CHAP is integrated in a Spinnaker. And so this idea that Spinnaker not only um, serves a purpose, which is delivery to the cloud and infrastructure management, but it becomes this abstraction for other tools and other platforms at Netflix that re helps reduce that cognitive load. We can point engineers and say, use Spinnaker, and Spinnaker will help you discover all the other tools that you need to do your job. I think that's um, that really makes Spinnaker a great example of um, developer experience. I think another interesting example I wanted to highlight is this other tool called Skipper. So um, Sangeeta's team is the uh, is developer experience team is part of Edge, and Edge is a, is a sub-organization within Netflix. And their org um, and her team recognized that they needed to build something more refined, more focused, to serve a slightly different purpose than uh, the typical Netflix engineering experience. And so they've also built a tool called Skipper that sits on top of um, Spinnaker and a bunch of other tools that are applicable predominantly for the edge engineering team. So this idea that even we're, you know, our organization, my organization, engineering tools are, we're, we're building tools for all engineers. Sub organizations are building more refined tools on top of that to help improve the developer experience in a more localized fashion. So let's talk about platforms. So when we talk about platforms, I often think about um, things that are, of course, are applicable to me, which are things like the build automation platform at Netflix. My team's responsible for helping build not just tools, but a suite of tools um, 
that can be composed together to form a whole platform for engineers at uh, Netflix to help build. Um, Spinnaker is an example of a, a cloud delivery platform and infrastructure management platform. Um, there's uh, RPC platforms at Netflix, telemetry platforms, persistence platforms. So when you think about building an application at Netflix or think about onboarding, these verticals, these, these different platforms are really the things that you need to learn or you need to get good at or your service needs to integrate with to, to, um, to build a service at Netflix. But it gets more complicated than that, especially for my team, because this vertical represents only a stack of uh, platforms for one language. As we start thinking about more languages, this picture gets more complicated. Netflix has traditionally been a Java shop. We've built a lot of services and tools and frameworks um, for the JVM and for Java app application developers. My team, going back to build, is responsible for building a Gradle-based build tool called Nebula that builds on that allows people to build and manage Java applications. But as Netflix becomes more polyglot, as we start moving into the world of Node.js, Python, and Ruby, um, we have to think differently about this. And I'm, this picture here shows how, at some point in time, our um, capabilities in these different platforms were very um, nascent and how we we had this very robust all green you can go to production with with java but not with other languages so for my team we think about both the the we can see these small little um platforms the vertical platforms how do we address this problem and so for us instead of building re relearning the lessons the failures of, or the lessons of building a single tool to solve a single um, solution for a single uh, language, we started thinking differently about how we solve this problem. So from my team's perspective, we built this tool called Newt. Um, Newt is a command, yeah, it's adorable, I know. Um, Newt is a command line tool written in Go, but the idea behind Newt is to stop thinking about a language specific implementation and start thinking about language agnostic solutions and workflow. So Newt really focuses on that middle area of how teams can not necessarily build their application, but how they can integrate their code, package their code, and um, deploy their code into the Netflix ecosystem. We decided to take a very different approach instead of focusing on build, to focus on really workflow and integration. So with Newt, it will not care about which build tool you're using for JavaScript, but it will care about build. It will have a Newt build phase and you attach to it a command that you wanted to run. And then Newt will help um, do a whole bunch of um, uh, in, uh, consistency integrations across all your environments, such as continuous integration, local environment, and your packaging. You can tell it my Node.js application is dependent on um, what's a great version of, of NPM, I don't know. I mean, I don't do Node.js development. But let's imagine that you want a, a specific version of Node NPM. It will make sure that that version's on every single developer's machine that's running uh, that app, that build on the CI server that's running that CI build. And when you package it up, it's going to be packaged up that same version. So this idea of providing consistency across environments is more important than providing a singular build tool for, for engineers. And then Newt also becomes our developer um, or developer platform for in engineers. And so we can now start scaling this horizontally across all languages. I don't have up here, but um, we have uh, some representatives from the studio team at Netflix here, which are building applications in Ruby. And um, Ruby is, is one of those pillars that we are adding adoption and integration to for Newt. OK, and so this last part of, is centralized enablement. And I think this is probably the easiest to address, which is for all these platforms, for all these different solutions, um, what you really have is you have teams, dedicated teams, focused on solving these problems. And these teams you can consider are really investments that the company is making in addressing this problem holistically. Um, once again, I'm gonna pick on Lauren, and not because I don't like Lauren, but because I think Lauren here works on the coolest team name at Netflix, which is the Traffic and Chaos team. Um, but, you know, the teams in red here, engineering tools, my team developed productivity as part of engineering tools. Spinnaker was built by engineering tools, but our charter is to build tools that help engineers get their code out the door. Sangeeta's team in red here is also the edge developer experience team. And so this idea of we have all these centralized teams focused on solving these problems in a very central way, um, I think represents the, an organization's investment in these problems, but it doesn't have to take the same um, 
it doesn't have to be about all about teams. At Netflix at scale, we can afford to have teams more focused on these different solving these problems. But you know, at some other uh, team scale, it might be a different. It might be a person. It might be a, a portion of someone's time focusing on solving these problems around developer experience or de de productivity engineering. And so, before I, I turn this over to um, to Pan and to Pan to talk about um, Strava, I want to talk a little bit about the meetup before we go on. So, and I'll have time for questions at the end. So we're gonna continue doing this meetup every other month. We like the model, I think, of not doing it monthly, but doing a kind of a, a higher value, higher impact meetup every other month and alternating. Um, that worked for us. I'm about to break that rule in a second. Um, we also like the idea of having two speakers. So rather than having I, I, on a lot of meetups, I used to run a meetup in back in DC where I was from, we would just do one speaker. I like the idea of having two speakers. It kind of increases the value proposition for engineers or for attendees. And what we're gonna try to do differently is, is try to alternate locations. So every single instance of the meetup has been held here in, in Los Gatos. So we're gonna try to move it up the peninsula, move up to San Francisco. So we're really gonna make an effort to go back and forth and try different locations. I expect uh, that I'll make it easier on people getting down here or us going up there. And we'll continue to record sessions. Um, and we'll continue to have the consent, I guess, as recording sessions. But also with, with the change here, now that we have this blog, I would love the, I love the idea of us being able to also augment and follow up sessions with blog posts about what we learned or what people talked about. I think that could also be valuable. So in January, next month, so we're not skipping uh, January, uh, the, the people at Airbnb have been nice enough to volunteer their space to host the January meetup. So we are hopefully going to plan it for late January. Um, we'll have two two meetup two talks, two speakers in uh, in the city. So that's exciting. And uh, if you're interested in telling a story, come join us. Come talk about this stuff. This is interesting. So questions. I saw every box that was green, yellow, and red. What is boot camp? Bootcamp is just onboarding. You can think about that as new developers come to Netflix. How do we get a Netflix engineer up and running and effective as soon as possible? How long does it take? So right now, Bootcamp is, I think, two days? Really? So, yeah. If you know the language pretty good. Uh, yeah, so another quirk here is that Netflix, we hire senior software engineers only. So generally speaking, we don't have like... No, we're here. Yeah. yeah. Well, the two days also includes um, sort of... Kind of Presentations and sort of, uh, learning about Netflix. Netflix, the architect overview, and all. Yeah. So, so he said, "Really, I don't know if you meant if it was. I don't know if it was two whole days of a lap time." No, setting. I meant that was a short amount of time. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, it doesn't mean that somebody comes out of boot camp two days later and is like extremely effective. Like I think uh, so this is an area of investment for us for sure. So your stuff's granular. You can learn in two days and start producing. No, I'm not making that claim. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? And besides the vlog and the video, there will be slides? Yeah, I, we can show the slides for sure. Yeah. So, um, Nude is a really interesting idea. I like the idea of thinking about your stack and then deciding which portions of it you could share tooling across tool chains. Do you have challenges with? the build host OS. I noticed it looks like all the tool chains you use seem like they'd be happy everywhere except Windows. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know, are you guys a Mac house or are you a workshop? I mean, there's like a 90% Mac. Like our devs are- All over the place? No, Linux and Mac, we're not a Windows shop. Yeah. I'm from TiVo, by the way, so we're a partner. Um, see your code and stuff, but like we definitely have challenges yeah. on tooling and efficiency side yeah. where we get something working great and then somebody's like, well, I don't want to use a Mac. Yeah. I'm a Linux person. Why does this suck so much? Yeah. It's like, well, you chose the sucky path. Like, I, 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 so do, do you do you live this challenge at all? Or? Yes. And so the majority, we saw the Mac case usually first when it comes to like laptop um, effectiveness. But right now we are looking at, like, I know we have some engineers that are on Microsoft and need to be on Microsoft for various, for, for Windows. Yeah, yeah. What do you guys on that box? I think so. We do have to solve that, but it's it. Yeah, it doesn't come without pain, for sure. 
so one um, there's some, some one area in which we we're looking um, one way in which we're looking to solve this one thing we're, we provide we're providing is a, a local uh, development experience that includes a sort of debugging right you can like hot cold reloading and, and all of that and so that's the type on of every thing. language on every host well no we're <laughs> so tough, right? Right, right so we're focused for this particular case on on node and so we oh. have that for the mac and you know we're using docker so linux we can do and then now when it comes to windows one one area we're thinking of investing in is cloud-based experience right so that helps in this case, then you're not worried about. It doesn't matter where you're typing. Local it's happening right, there. Right, right, and yeah, I think yeah. that solves. That's an interesting area of um, that I'm. You know, we're seeing mm -hmm. uh, developments in, in the, you know, uh, anyway with Lambda and all of that. That's that's an area of uh, exploration anyway. But I can see it being powerful and beneficial and help. It helps with this. I think it was also was missing from the slide is the context that like each of those verticals also represents different types of use cases. So um, the Java vertical is streaming critical services at Netflix. The Python vertical is um, niche weird services sometimes written by the security team, some, but a vast majority are actually data science. Um, then you have JavaScript, which is like a whole, there's a the whole team that's focused on a Node.js uh, platform. And so there are still, there's, it doesn't have to be, new doesn't have to represent every single possible use case. It can be focused on the team specific use case. And so what you end up having is actually not only just the language platform, but actually a kind of a, a, a focused use case for that platform within that team's needs. Same with the, 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 the budding uh, Ruby, um, Studio need so. And I think that's what the extensibility model helps. Yeah. Too, right. Having yeah. you can have richer functionality for two in one place months. or where you need it. So yeah. It's it's a just in time new development. No. <laughs> <laughs> so other hands. Oh. Yeah, um, I had a question kind of about the the ideas of the abstraction and, and centralizing it, and I'm wondering if. Uh, if you, either of you guys kind of think that to a certain extent there's like a little bit of tension there where you know if you are building really high level abstractions you know you end up in a situation where you use if your tool if they encounter issues that they don't understand they're sort of their hands are tied and they don't know what to do and I'm kind of curious like what you guys think about the, the line yeah i mean i i um whenever you say something like abstractions like what i think is like people you're not doing this, I'm not accusing you of anything, but like what will often happen is people say, well, that's an extreme, so let's abstract. They're, they're talking about abstracting everything versus abstracting nothing. And, and the answer is really this nuanced, middle, hard to find exactly where that is. But that's the interesting challenge. Like you, you're going to find that right tension where um, I'm going to provide you sufficient abstractions. I think what, when we think about abstractions, at least my team talks about it, is, is abstracting away the common use cases. So like the majority of people don't have to worry about the details. But you always want to give somebody the opportunity to open up the hood and actually dig in there and actually do what they need to do. And I think that satisfies the majority of Netflix engineers' needs. As, as long as I have a way of actually changing this, I'm totally fine with the abstraction. Yeah, I think that's a big one. I mean, it, it's hard to get it right, right? Magic is great as long as it works. And then when it doesn't work, everybody hates it. Um, so it, just finding that. So uh, one of the principles we follow is this idea that it's a UX design principle called progressive disclosure. You start with a uh, minimum, right? And then as needed, you expose more, you expose more, uh, and that's made about the reason. I mean, actually, a great example, Mike had, he had Spinnaker, and all our server engineers use Spinnaker, but um, a part of what my team is building is their JavaScript client engineers, they're not hired for their server engineering skills. So for them, there's even an abstraction level on top of Spinnaker. They don't need to go to Spinnaker. They don't, don't want to do regions and clusters and servers. So um, they can drop down to Spinnaker if they need to, but they don't have to. And that's where APIs also help. Spinnaker has a well-defined API we can build on top of it. Any other questions? Okay. So give us a minute while we switch out for a pan. Thank you.